everyone. It's really nice to see you. Welcome to church this morning. We pray that um, you've come excited and expectant into the Lord's house this morning. It's great to see the children. And thank you, children, for bringing your parents along to church. We have got the heating on. Uh, please don't moan if it's too warm because I can easily turn it off. So um, uh, it, we have got it on, but we will try to keep it as uh, regulated as possible. I'm going to uh, sit down in a few moments. I'd like to welcome you to someone that you might not have met for a while. Jackie is uh, here. Uh, Ron said, you better welcome Jackie back. Uh, and I said, well, I've, I've seen her before. But Jackie, over to you and lead us in your particular way. Morning. <laughs> uh, before we start, can I just, I know John a few weeks ago um, thanked everybody for their prayers and everything that they'd given and done, uh, but I'd just like to say ditto. Thank everybody, all those people that brought food to the house or left it on, a ha on the door handle, uh, for the cards, for the flowers, for the poems and for the praise. Uh, thank you, thank you ever so much, I'm really grateful. And um, knowing God is just great, isn't it? I just got a reading, I read it the other day, and I just wanna share it, I won't share all of it with you because we'll be here too long, but it's from one Colossians, so read it all when you go home. But it just says this towards the end, and I'm not really sure where to start, I'll start from here. And it's 1 Colossians. We also pray that you will be strengthened with his glorious power so that you will have all the patience and endurance you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father who has enabled you to share the inheritance that belongs to God's holy people who live in the light. For he has rescued us. He's rescued us. Hallelujah. Thank you. For he has rescued us. Yeah. yeah. From the one who rules in the kingdom of darkness. That's who we've been rescued from. And he has brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. An even bigger hallelujah. God has purchased our freedom with his blood and has forgiven all our sins. So we can celebrate this morning. Obviously, if you're not a Christian, you've got not much to celebrate. But if you are, you've got a heck of a lot to celebrate this morning. And we're going to start with the first song, which is Rainbow. And the song goes, the rainbow in the sky. Um, oh, I can't remember now. It shows God's promises are true. They're true. Believe it. Grasp hold of it. We've been rescued. Come on, let's get on our feet. I need some children out here to do actions because I'm not really much of a stretcher at the moment.
we thank you so much that we can rely on your promises no matter what. We thank you that you're a God who cannot lie. And Father, we live in a world that is, seems to be filled with lies. I thank you that we can stand on your promises. I thank you that we can always count on you. I thank you that you're a God who says, I will never leave you. And I will never let you down, yet we let you down so often. And Father God, I pray that today we make a promise to you that we'll recommit, that we'll say, you are mine and I am yours. And Father, we make those promises so easily and so glibly. Father, may we mean it and stand by what we say the same way you do for us. Father, we commit today into your hands. May it be used for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We're going to sing another song now. I want to say as well, I've really enjoyed sitting and worshipping with everybody else. And what a brilliant job from, you've all uh, done Corinthians at the front. Chapter 12. So if you want to uh, grab your Bible or grab a church Bible, then please uh, feel free to do that. <coughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll start at verse 7 uh, I'd encourage you to read all of it but we'll start um, down there at verse 7 and we know that God really used Paul in a, a, a dramatic and significant way uh, when he was alive and the writings of Paul are, are very significant as well. Um, but Paul struggled with uh, this particular thorn in the flesh. He had something that he used to struggle with, whether, whether it was a particular habit or um, whether it was a, an illness or a disability. We don't really know what it was, but it was something. And I think uh, when I shared this passage with you last time, I... I, I said, I'm sure that there is something that we all struggle with. And you looked at me in the way that you're looking at me now. Surely not I, John. I don't struggle with anything. And I've got no problems at all and my life is perfect. Well, actually, Ken Payne put his hand up on his leg and said, that's me and I uh, relate to all of that. And it's the same for me is that we've all got things that we struggle with, and our life, our life is trying to be free of all these struggles, all these difficulties, all these problems. And I have to say that you will probably carry some of them to your grave. That's depressing. But some you'll be able to deal with, and some you'll be able to overcome in his power and his strength. Let's look at this, verse seven. To keep me from boasting, conceited, because they, um, oh, because of these surpassing great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, and in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. That's a great passage of scripture, as, as many other passages are. But when we read that, and we meditate upon it, we think and we reflect on it, what does it mean for us? Well, we just uh, skip back a couple of weeks to last week. When we looked at this particular verse, my grace, God says to Paul, in his struggle, in his difficulty, in his problem, in his hardship, whatever it was, God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. And those that were here a couple of weeks ago will remember that I shared, uh, that I'd looked into the Greek and what it all meant, and basically what God was saying to Paul is, I am enough. I am enough. 
And do you know we live our lives with all this peripheral stuff? We're desperate to have this, we're desperate to have that, we're desperate to have this house or this, we're desperate to have this mortgage, perhaps not. We're desperate to have this holiday, we're desperate to have this type of car or this husband or this wife or this partner. We're desperate for all of these things and they're going to bring us what we need. And God says to Paul, I am enough. I am enough for you. I'm enough for your circumstances. I'm enough for your life. I'm enough for your, your provision. I'm enough for your food. I'm enough for your family. I am enough. Jesus said, seek me first. Seek me first. Seek first the kingdom of God. And all of these things will be added to you as well. What do you want from God this morning? Isn't it right to say to God, you are enough. You give to me what you know I need. He doesn't always bring to us what we want. He doesn't always bring to us what we desire. He brings to us what we need. Because God is enough. Job, you remember Job? Had everything stripped away. And you know, some of you, you might feel like that's happened or happening or your circumstances are such that everything's been stripped away. And Job says, doesn't he, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know that my God is enough. My grace, God says, is sufficient for you. But I want us to move on from that place. I don't want us to get stuck in saying, yes, God is enough, yes, God is enough, yes, God is enough. Because how does God become strong in our weakness? And I want us to try and uh, tease out what it means, this particular verse at the end, for when I'm weak, then I am strong. How many people feel weak this morning? How many people, you feel, so, sometimes you feel weak, don't you? Coming to church, you might feel weak in your spirit, you might feel weak in your relationships. You might feel weak in your finances. You might feel weak in your academic ability. You might feel weak in your job. So your, your job is, uh, is, is weak. Um, you, might, you might feel weak in your own personality, in your own self-confidence. You might look in the mirror and think, oh, that's not good. I used to look like that, but now I look like that. And you might feel weak about how you feel about yourself. You might feel weak in your physical body. So you've got some problems that are occurring in your, uh, in your, in your physical body. But what does it mean for weakness? Now, we look, uh, Paul mentions it three times when God says to him about his grace is sufficient for you. And then God goes on to say, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So as Christians, as God's people, we want the power of God in our lives. Is that fair to say? How many people want the power of God in their lives? You want the power of God. You want more of him. How many people pray this prayer? Lord, I want more of you and less of me. Anyone ever pray that prayer? It's a decent prayer to pray. But it's a scary prayer. Because what God tends to do is he strips away the rubbish that's in your life. He takes away all the things because his power must come through your weakness. So you've got to be humbled so that he can be exalted. How do we do that? It's a great sermon to preach, isn't it? Uh, lots of other things that I can say. But I want you to be able to leave this church saying, this is what I need to do. This is what I can do. This is okay if I feel like this because this is going to be happening in my particular circumstances. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So Paul goes on to say, therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses. So that's his boasting about his weaknesses. <laughs> How many of us boast about our weaknesses? I'm so weak in that area. Do you know Paul is a, a huge contrast, isn't he? In, in one hand he's weak and in the other hand he's strong. You see it, don't you, with his preaching, with his teaching, with his ministry. 
As a person, he was weak. But through the power and the Holy Spirit of God, he was strong. If, if, if God takes away my life, he'll be glorified. You see, Paul would do anything for his Savior, for his Lord, and so that God's power <coughs> might manifest itself in his life and in the environment that God had placed him. Number two, and this isn't the sermon, by the way, when we get to number three, there's a little bit more to it. He says, I boast more, I, I boast in my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. He boasts in his weaknesses. Hey, look at my weakness. I delight, says in verse 10. I delight in my weaknesses. How do you get on with your weakness? Hey, Jackie, I'm so weak in that area. Do you know what we do with our weaknesses? We fill them. We cover them. We hide them. Many, many people that are feeling weak this morning just stay at home. They don't come into God's house. They don't try to enter into God's holy presence. They just stay at home. What do you do at home? Do you know I've had a dreadful experience these last five or six weeks because I've had to stay at home sometimes when you've been here. It's been a dreadful experience. Do you know what's on the television <coughs> on a Sunday morning? Do you know what's on the television on a Sunday night? It's dreadful. It's painful to watch. And then we sometimes flick onto the God channel and you've got some guy from East Africa shouting because the, the sound levels aren't very good. Occasionally you get someone quite good, but do you know, I want to be in the house of the Lord. And I believe that God's power is manifest in our weaknesses. And I'll explain what that means in, the, in a little while. <coughs> so you've got Paul saying three times, I boast more gladly about my weaknesses. I delight in my weaknesses in verse 10. And then at the end he says, for when I'm weak, then I am strong. You've probably heard this verse before in Zechariah, chapter 4 and verse 2. You haven't got to find it. It might take us half an hour together. I found it difficult to find. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. How many of us rest on our own abilities? How many of us rest on our own skills? How many of us rest on our own self-confidence? How many of us rest on the confidence of others? Perhaps a husband, perhaps a father, perhaps a dominant relative. How many of us are confident in uh, the country, in the land we live in, in the government that we have? How many of us rest on all of these things? But what God is saying is it's not by might, it's not by your power, but it's by my spirit. It's by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God manifesting his self in our lives. And I've got to say to you this morning that if you're not seeing the power of God working in your life as a man and a woman of God that's following him, you need to go back to step one. You need to go back to the cross. You need to revisit who you are as a person, as a human being, and as a Christian. Because the power of God must be at work in your life. If you're a footballer, you play football. If you're a Christian, the power of God moves through you. Hallelujah. The power of God moves through you. you. We're agents of God. God's people, we're his agents. Isn't it great to be an agent? I'm 004. And Maddie's 008. Darren's 00 something or other. But you know, we're far better than Bond characters. Or Bond girls, some of you would want to be. Britt Eklund. Is he Britt Eklund? I don't know. What's that one? Halle Berry. But you know, it's not about being on the X Factor or being famous or being well known. It's being agents of God that his power works through. And I'm convinced that the church today in Great Britain and Wales is weak because the people are weak. And they've not understand the 
the position of weakness that takes you to the place where the Spirit of God moves through you. We're just weak. And I believe we're weak because we've become focused on ourselves. What we do. What we want. What we like. Where we like to go. What we want to eat. What we want to wear. Where we want to live. What we want to do. Who we want to marry. What children we want to do. What clubs we want to go to. What money we want to spend. We're weak because we become focused on ourselves. We become inward looking. And the vessel, which is you and which is me, has become weak. Has become cracked. And God wants to work powerfully through that vessel. And the vessel has become so focused on itself that God is almost at a position where he's saying, I just can't find anyone that I can send my power through. <clears throat> the power of God at work in his people. So here we are. Weakness. You see, I say to you, sometimes you feel weak. Most days, most weeks you feel weak. There's two positions to take. Weakness is close to giving up. A weakness where you allow someone else to take full control of your life. Jackie's been through a terrible, terrible time these last six weeks. Because she's had to allow me to take control of her life. You men don't understand what it's like. You women understand what I mean. Watch a man who is not gifted in the home doing things that you know you can do far, far better. Amen? But God has laid Jackie down to be weak. And Jackie's had to take a position where someone else takes control of her in her weakness. And I believe that God brings us low so that he might become strong. And that very often in our lives, we're so busy, we're so active, <coughs> we're so doing, we're so doing, we're so doing that we forget about the position that we need to take to allow the power of God to work through us. Let's just think for a moment at the points where you might be weak, weakest. Sickness. Let's just think about this for a moment. Sickness laid low. Sickness sometimes leads to death. Is that fair to say? Many, many people fear death. I'd like to point you to Stephen, just for a moment. Stephen, one of the first, um, the first disciples. In Acts chapter 7, verses 56 to 60, Stephen was at his lowest physical points his weakest physical points when they heard this they were furious and gnashed their teeth but Stephen full of the Holy Spirit looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of good God, look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelled at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Stephen at his weakest, lowest physical points. While they were stoning him, can you imagine what it's like to be stoned? They, these weren't the smooth pebbles that you get from the beach. These were rocks. These were jagged rocks. Perhaps like bricks. Other, other types of rocks that they would throw. 
while they were stoning him, Stephen at his weakest physical points. What did he do? He prayed. At his weakest physical points. I'm going to ask you this morning, sometimes you get to your weakest physical points. What do you do? What do you do? Do you moan? Do you get angry? Do you get bitter? Do you get annoyed? Do you moan at your husband or your wife or your loved ones? Stephen prayed. It wasn't just any ordinary prayer. It was a gut-wrenching prayer from his deepest possible place. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, and this I can't understand, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. At his weakest physical points, he cared. He cared. I want you to just think for a moment about Jesus. Think for a moment about <coughs> Jesus. Think about Jesus' weakest physical points. I know uh, that's good, yeah. Well, I think he's going to be a preacher in a few years. He's going to be good. I think you probably need a cloth for your face with that. <laughs> no, it's lovely. It's better that he does that than cries. <laughs> he's very welcome to do whatever he wants. <laughs> but we just, uh, we just think a, a moment about Jesus. And then we're going to finish and we're going to pray. I'm going to think and reflect on what God might be saying to you this morning. Jesus at his weakest physical points. Where was that? <coughs> Anybody know? In the Garden of Gethsemane. That's right. In the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, verse 41. You haven't got to turn to it. It's only a little, uh, a little verse. Jesus at his weakest physical points. Said this in verse 41. He prayed, didn't he? It's funny, isn't it, that at, at Stephen's weakest moments, at Jackie's weakest moments, do you know I was with Jackie in the, uh, in, almost in the operating theatre? Do you know that little pre preparation room? And they're all lying on the tables, and they're all in those beautiful blue gowns that if you're a woman, you don't want to turn round, or if you're a man, you don't want to turn round unless you've shaved. You're back. <laughs> um, and, and I was in that room, and Jackie was there just before she was going to have her operation. And Jackie says to me, pray. She was at her weakest physical points. Do you know, she didn't say to me, put EastEnders on. She didn't say, darling, watch the football. She didn't say, go and make me some food or hang the washing out. Thank goodness. So if I hear that, that phrase again, could you hang the washing out? I'm glad it's raining. I'm really glad it's raining. But it builds up, doesn't it, to worry. It builds up if it's raining. I know that now. I worry about the washing. I never used to. I just say, where's my trousers? Now I worry about the washing. Anyway, Jackie was at her weakest physical points. She'd been starved. She was going in for an operation. And you know what that's like. I haven't experienced it in that way. But what did she want to do? She wanted to pray. She wanted to connect with God. And do you know there were six people uh, in, on those beds? And they were all full of fear. They were all full of fear. You could see it in their eyes. One girl was crying. One guy was trying to look cool, but he just looked so scared. And Jackie wanted <coughs> to connect with God. And Jesus, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, didn't he? And he asked uh, his father if the cup would be taken from him. And he fell on his face and he prayed. And we know about the, the drops of blood that were coming down his, as he was praying. He was at a low physical point. But he says this, the spirit is willing. In verse 41, the spirit is willing, 
but the body is weak. How many people have a weak body? Come on, your body's weak, isn't it? It creaks, it groans. We've got a little one here. It's great, isn't it? But as he gets older, his body's going to get weaker and he's going to have problems and difficulties. Our bodies are weak. Our minds are weak. But you know, Jesus says, but the spirit is willing. Is your spirit willing? And you know, a, a, a thought came to me as I, I was preparing this, that Jesus' spirit, his will, his drive remained the same, didn't it? His focus, his purpose, his desire, his call, his mission was not weak. But his body was. But his spirit was strong. I just want to get you to think about Jesus' arrest. What did they do to Jesus when they arrested him? What did they attack? His body. Didn't they? And we read the books about martyrs. What did they attack? They attacked their bodies. And Jesus was spat on. Jesus was whipped. Jesus was beaten. They even tried to verbally humiliate Jesus, didn't they? They mocked him. They placed the, the crown of thorns on his head and they mocked him and they laughed at him. But it didn't alter his drive, his purpose, his call, his mission, his destiny. That wasn't altered at all, was it? And do you know what struck me? Is that at Jesus' physically weakest moments, he conquered death. He conquered Satan. And he conquered sin. And as I was reading this and as I was praying, praying about it and thinking and reflecting on what to share with me, that we share with you, that came to me. That at Jesus' weakest physical moment, when he was on the cross, when he was dying, when he was bleeding for you and for me, when he was on that cross, what did he do on the cross? And it, it came to me at Jesus' physically weakest moments. And God does powerful things in and through your physically weakest moments. You've got to go with it. When you're down, when you're low, when you're struggling, when there are issues, you've got to go with it. Because he has a plan, he understands and he has a purpose for you. And at Jesus' physically weakest moments, what did he do? He conquered death. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? You know that there is no sting in death for Christians. Can you confidently get up every day and say, if this is my last day, I know where I'm going and I know what I'm doing. This is only temporal. But what's prepared for us is eternal. This is temporal. He's listening now, he's thinking, he's a good preacher. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> it's not spitting anymore, that's good, isn't it? It's like, uh, who was that politician that used to spit everywhere? I can't remember. Is it Michael Heseltine? No. Who was it? Roy Hattersley, that's right. You could, you could be the next Roy Hattersley. Brilliant. At Jesus' physically weakest moments, spiritually, he conquered death, he conquered sin, and he conquered sin. I'm going to pray. Because some of you are weak. But I'll have to say that in all churches... Some of you are physically weak and spiritually weak. And I don't mind if you're physically weak. You see Lorraine, and we love Lorraine, and she comes into church, and she's physically weak, but sometimes her physical weakness affects <coughs> her spiritual life as well. And when you're going through difficult times, or when you're uh, physically weak, it can affect your spiritual life as well. Go with your physical weaknesses. Because they come in and they go out and they come in and they go out. But what needs to be strong is your spiritual life, your spiritual nature and your spiritual world. There might be stuff in your life that you've, you've, blocked, you've blocked God out with. 
and you're trying to do everything that everyone else is doing. You know everyone else out there, they're just like, like rats or, or mice on a hamster wheel. Hamsters on a hamster wheel, perhaps that's better. Because rats wouldn't go on a hamster wheel, they'd go on a rat wheel. But you know they just go round on this wheel. Round, and they're all trying to do the same thing. I was watching X Factor with Hannah last night. What a dreadful program. So sad. So sad. Isn't it sad? Do you watch it and feel sad? I do. It stirs me up as a man of God to watch X Factor. So sad. See these people crying. We, we as the church need to cry for those people on X Factor. So sad. I felt so sorry for the homeless guy <coughs> that was trying to do something and he forgot his lines because he found a settee to go to sleep on. So sad. He could have made it big. He couldn't have made it big. I can sing as well as he can. Well, I can't. <laughs> but it's so sad. It is so sad. And they're just on the hamster wheel. Over and over and over. And as men and women of God, we've got to not get on that hamster wheel. We've got to be different. Because God's got a plan, and He's got a purpose, and He's got a direction for your life. And whether you're physically weak, that doesn't matter. Say, I have strength.
Which was love.